Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this session. Um, I work as a, a developer advocate at Confluent, uh, one of the companies who contribute to the open source Apache Kafka project. Um, and I want to talk today about this idea of Kafka as a platform. So not just like what is Kafka and the kind of like the usual tech talk of like these are the different components and all that kind of stuff that you kind of soon, sometimes lose the context for like, well, why do we even need it in the first place? So I want to take a step back and think about why do we even need it in the first place and then explain the different pieces in it. So it's not going to be a super technical deep dive into it. I'm going to use the word API, so that won't be too scary, but we're just going to lay out the landscape of what actually Kafka is, what it does, what it's really good at. Um, so let's get started with that. I'm at Armoff on Twitter, so that's me in the, uh, the bottom right of the screen there. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's always good to get tweets. Tell me if you liked it. Tell me if you didn't like it. It's always good to get that feedback also. So what Kafka does for us is it actually gives us a new category of software that treats something called events as first-class objects. And events are actually all around us. And events model the real world. You work with data, almost all of you, in your day-to-day -day jobs, and you'll have systems that have data, and you store data in databases, and you store, database, uh, store data in uh, message queues, and those SQL stores, and all of this data that you work with almost all of it started life as an event. And events are super powerful because events tell us that something happened and they tell us what happened. And events happen continually. Events are unbounded. So if you think about the kind of things that happen in your businesses, that happen in your domain of expertise, I'm sure you can easily think of examples of events. Or if you can't easily, and that's fine because Easily is kind of like a loaded word to be using, but if you think carefully about the data with which you work, you can quite easily trace it back to an event. So an example of human generated events, someone walks into a shop, or well, nowadays they probably click on a website instead, and they order something, or they go and buy something, and that's an event. It happened at a point in time, and something happened, it was a purchase, and what happened? Well, they bought themselves a Snickers bar. Or we move some stock around a warehouse. Something happened, stock was moved, it happened at a point in time, and what happened? Well, it was this piece of stock and it moved from this warehouse to that warehouse. And these are events. And you also get machine-generated events. You get uh, IoT devices which are continually logging readings and sending information about the temperature or the, the humidity. You get network events. Our firewalls and our routers are like, how many packets have I just processed and how many uh, inbound things have just happened on this particular part. Our applications are also a source of events. When your application throws an error, then that is an event. It happened at a point in time. What happened? There was an error. And oh, sorry, something happened. It was an error. What happened? Well, here is my stack trace. So almost all the data that we work with starts life as an event. And we can use these events to build powerful applications. We can drive applications that respond to something happening. We can use events to actually build a picture of what happened in our business beyond what we actually get if we simply capture the summation of it, the, the, the final state. So if you look at what's in that uh, warehouse at the moment, you see, well, we have a pallet of sticker bars over here. Well, how did it get over there? When did it move? When it moved, that was the event. So events give us this functionality and you can roll events up into state so you can still have your databases and your NoSQL stores and all the rest of it. But what you can't have is what events give you, which is this view of things happening over time. So these events are everywhere and these events are super powerful and we can build applications, we can build analytics around them. And we need something to be able to do that on. We can use existing technologies to kind of like mimic certain behaviors with events. And in Latin, in kind of like recent years, some technologies have tried to play catch up and kind of like bolt on certain bits of functionality. But you can kind of tell when you're using something which is actually designed from the outset to work with a specific principle. And in this case, we want to work with events as a first class object. So here is our humble event. It could be a click on a website, it could be an order being placed, it could be a reading from our IoT devices, it could be anything that is an event. And events happen continually, unbounded over time, so we have lots of different events. And events can happen at a rate of 10,000 per second, they could happen at a rate of two per day. 
There's nothing proscribed in like the rate at which they have to occur for it to be an event stream. Things happen continually. These are events and we want to work with them. And we want a system with which we're going to be able to work with them powerfully. So let's say these events, we're going to give them a key and a value. We don't want to be too prescriptive and kind of like, what are we going to store and how are we going to store it and stuff like that? Because then we start to impose our own design decisions upon it. So we're just going to say, we'll store a key and a value that's going to represent that event. Where are we going to store it? Well, if we take these events, and as I say, they happen over time, we can create a log of them. So we're going to say, well, an event happens, we'll write it to the log. Another event happens, we'll write it to the log. And what we'll do is we'll append these events to the log each time they happen. And as I say, that could be 10,000 a second, that could be two a day. As an event happens, we append it to the log. Now, this log is immutable. It's append only, and it is immutable. Meaning, you cannot go back and change something. Because we're talking about time here. You can't rewind time, much as you may wish to. You may have an argument with someone and say something that you really wish you hadn't, but once those words are uttered, they have been spoken, and what you said has been said. You can't rewind time and go back and change it. All you can do is try and counteract it. You can go and apologize and try and undo what you said. So you could append another event to this log that kind of says, like, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But you can't actually go back and change what has happened. So if we're talking about Apache Kafka here, the, you have this guarantee that it provides that the logs are immutable, which actually gives us some super powerful concepts on which to build applications, because you're now guaranteed that the data that you read has not changed since it was written to that log. So this immutable um, event log, it is append only, and we send the events to the end of it as they occur. This log file, it's not like a log file if you're thinking of like log4j and like log.txt and stuff like that. There are related concepts, but here we're talking about a log file. Kafka itself stores it on disk as like its own internal object. And that's kind of like an implementation, kind of like the guts of it, like the bits and the bytes and stuff like that. And as developers, we want to kind of like abstract that a little bit because we need a way to actually arrange our data. So we're going to take this concept of a log, which kind of like does actually exist. You can dig down into it and actually see it within the system. But we want to work with a log, and we're going to say we're going to carve it up into entities which describe the different bits of data that we've got. And we call these topics. So we can say we're going to create a topic, and on this topic, we're going to write all of the events to do with clicks on our website. Every time we get a click event, we write that to the clicks topic. Every time someone places an order, we write that to the order topic. We can also capture information in Kafka topics about things which don't necessarily feel like events. And if we talk about clicks and orders, and once we understand this idea of an event as being something that happened and what happened, we kind of quite easily understand that, well, we're going to just capture those, and that gives us a stream of things that have happened. And if you're from an analytics background like myself, these are facts. Okay, When facts happen continually, there are events. But on here, we have something saying, well, customers. And that's analytics terms is like reference data, lookup data. But that also makes a lot of sense to capture in a Kafka topic. Because if you think about when a customer gets created in your system, that's an event. When the customer moves house, that's an event. When the customer changes their email address, that's an event. And if you capture those events, you can actually replay them to find out the current state for where does this customer current live, currently live and what is their email address. So you capture those events. So not only can you find out what's their current state, you can also look back and see, well, when did that change or how many times have they changed their email address? And those events themselves are also useful. So basically, when something happens, you model it as an event because it is an event. and You can capture that on Kafka topics. These topics, we're going to carve up one more time in something called partitions. So within each uh, topic, you can have one or more partitions. You don't have to partition it. You could just have a single partition. And there are a couple of use cases where that's uh, a very good idea, where you'll want to do that. Most of the time, though, you'll want to partition your topics, because as we see, we're going to see later, partitions are our unit of scale. And it's a good idea to think about it up front rather than later on. The reason for that is that within a partition, Kafka gives us the guarantee of strict ordering. 
So as there is that guarantee of immutability, Kafka guarantees that within the partition of a topic, the messages as they arrive on that topic, that order is guaranteed to remain the same when we read it out of the topic. And once you start repartitioning a topic and say, well, we'll start off with one partition because I kind of, I'm just like trying this thing out. And then you say, oh, turns out we need to scale. We need to partition that topic into like 10. When you do that repartitioning, your ordering guarantees get lost. So you'd have to manage that in your application itself and it gets a bit more complicated. So thinking about how many partitions you might want up front and there's various ballpark figures which are useful to work with is a really good idea. So we've got our strict ordering of messages within a partition within a topic. Now let's think about how we get our data in and out of Kafka. So Kafka, uh, if you've heard of the term pub sub, it lets you do this. We can publish data into it. We can subscribe to data from it. But some really important differences from other pub sub systems that you may be familiar with. In terms of the publish side of things, in terms of getting data in to Kafka, we use the producer API. So the producer API, it does what we said earlier, which is an event happens in the world. We append it to the log. The producer API says, I'll take that message that you've given me and I'll write it to the given topic. It will handle where is the broker, the network protocol, which partition am I going to write it to? It will do all of that for you. And you can say, well, I'm going to use a particular set of code. So this is an example of using the Go client. There's Go, there's Java, there's Python, there's C, C++. There's, there's a whole ton of different languages that are supported with the clients. Um, so you say, I've got my data here. There's my broker. And you can say, well, just send it to that topic. And you can also override things like, we'll give it this timestamp or send it to this particular partition. But by default, it's pretty simple. Here's my message. Here's the optional key. Send it to that particular topic. Now, we talked about keys very briefly earlier on. And keys come into real importance when it comes to partitions. Because the key defines which partition, by default, a message is going to go to. If you don't give your message a key, and you don't have to, then the messages you'll just get round robined across all of the available partitions. So you get a nice even distribution of messages, but you don't get any guarantee of which partition your messages are going to end up in. So that's not always what you want. So a lot of the time you'll say, well, my data has got like specific um, need to be in a certain partition, either for this strict uh, guarantee of ordering or because when we process this data and we want to do so in parallel, and I'll talk about that in a moment, we want to make sure that each instance that's processing it gets all of the data for a particular instance of an entity. So if we're processing order data, let's say this, the, the topic that we're showing on the screen here with four partitions, it's information about orders. And an order will get created, it will get uh, marked as pending, it will get paid, it will get shipped, it will get completed. And you have all these different events related to a particular order. And you'll want to make sure that all of those events for a given order are on the same partition. Otherwise, applications that are processing that data in parallel are going to end up kind of getting data for different orders and won't be able to guarantee that they're processing all of that data for a given order. So we need to make sure that when we write data into Kafka, if we have that kind of requirements to our data, that it has to be on a particular partition, then we need to set the key for the message. We set the key to the order ID in this example, and then it takes a hash of that order ID and it will always end up on the same partition. So this is not to say that if you have 10,000 orders, you need 10,000 partitions. You could have two partitions and each partition is gonna get 5,000 orders, but the important thing is each partition will get the same orders within it. You won't have one order split across partitions if you set up your keys correctly. You can override the partitioning and kind of like do additional fancy stuff with it if you want to, but those are the basics of how it gets assigned. And that's pretty much, I'm kind of like glossing over a bit of stuff here, but that's pretty much as complicated as the producer API gets. Here's my message, there's my topic, there's my broker, and if we want to, here's the key to affect the partitioning. So producers, we use it in our client applications, it puts messages onto topics, it does the nitty gritty of partitioning and network protocols and stuff like that, there's a bunch of different clients, uh, languages that are supported. You can also use the REST proxy. For performance reasons, it's much better to use the native uh, client support if it's available for your language or environment. But if not, you can use the REST proxy to put data onto these topics. Now, getting data out is slightly more complicated. And I kind of actually skipped ahead a little bit 
uh, then when I was talking about consuming in parallel and stuff like that. So let's get into that now. Taking a step back, when we read data out of Kafka, we do so sequentially. We go to Kafka as our consuming application, we use the consumer API, and we say, I would like to read some data from this topic. And Kafka will say, okay, I can start at the beginning of the log over here, and you can read every single message. I can start at the end of the log, and I'll just give you any new messages that arrive. And your application can also say, actually, I'd like to skip to offset 42 and read messages from there. Or I'd like to stick, skip to the timestamp that corresponds to like three o'clock yesterday afternoon and read the messages from there. Your client application can also say, well, I started at the end and I was processing them, and now I'd like to go back a bit and kind of like read some messages from back that point there. So applications can seek back and forth in the log. The only thing is that access when they're reading is then sequential. Now, when consumers read data from Kafka, the messages don't get deleted. So let that sink in for a moment because this is very different from other systems you may be thinking of. When you read a message from Kafka, that message remains on the topic. When we delete messages from Kafka, that happens in a completely separate process. It's defined by the retention policies for each topic, and you define that per topic, and you can say, this topic over here, I want to store 10 gigabytes worth of data. And when we hit 10 gigabytes, then we start to get rid of the old stuff. We can say, I want to keep data based on time. You say, I want to keep seven days worth of clicks, because after that, they're kind of like less useful. I want to keep 10 years worth of orders. I want, in fact, want to keep my customer data forever. And that's completely valid and plenty of people do that. You say, well, actually, whether or not we've received an event for a given customer in the last 10 years, doesn't matter. I want to always have access to that customer information. You can do something called compacted topics, where it says, well, actually, we'll kind of like compact it down, but we'll always keep the latest value for a given key. But this is how you manage when data leaves Kafka, when it gets deleted out of Kafka. It's completely separate from when people read data from Kafka. And because of that, this is super useful, because because of that, we can have our original application. So Sally is our application here. She's reading messages from a topic for maybe the original use case that we envisaged. But then someone else comes along and says, oh, you've got order data on a topic, like a live stream of order data with historical orders as well. That's really useful. I'll use that also. So then someone else can come along and they can also read data from that topic. Maybe they just process new data. Maybe they go back and scan through old stuff. But we now build separate applications reading the same data that are independent of each other. So this is massively useful because we can build systems where something happens in the world, we produce it into a Kafka topic, and our multiple different applications can independently use that data. If one of those applications crashes, the other two just carry on happily. The data will sit in the topic until it's been aged out, and that way we can build nice, flexible, loosely coupled systems. Consumer API, this is what it looks like in Go. In Go, we can receive the messages on a different channel. You simply say, I'd like to subscribe to this particular topic, and you receive the messages as they arrive. Single consumer, a single instance of a consumer, will receive data from all the partitions in a topic which is what you would want. You don't want to say, give me the data, and you only don't get some of the data. That would be fairly pointless. So a single instance of a single application gets all of the data from all the partitions. We can have multiple different consumers. One consumer is Sally, is doing like fraud processing, gets all of the data from all partitions. Another application is Fred, and is doing analytics, gets all of the data from all the partitions. Now, perhaps C1 here, that blue box at the top of the screen, can't keep up with the processing at the throughput that we actually need to deliver. So they're doing something super complicated or we've got a very tight window in which we need to process the data. We can horizontally scale that application and create additional instances of it. So in this case, it looks like this. We have multiple instances of C1 and they form what's called a consumer group. So in this diagram here, I realized that this is kind of like ambiguous. That C1 square is actually an instance. These are all C1 instances that are labeled ambiguously. That's a silly idea for me to do that. But within this instance here, this consumer group representing the whole consumer application, you have four instances of it. We've scaled it out horizontally. And so because we have four instances of that same logical application, and we have four partitions, each instance gets data from one partition. And Kafka does that for us. 
Kafka says, okay, you formed a consumer group. I will sort out who gets which data. And if we lose one of those instances, Kafka says, oh, we've lost one of you. I will make sure that someone else takes on that processing. I use four partitions and four instances of the application. You don't have to have four and four. You could have four partitions and two instances. So if you go from one to two, you're going to double your throughput. Each of those instances will get data from two partitions. If we have four and four, then each one gets one partition. If we have five or if we have eight instances of the application and four partitions, we don't process it any faster than four because there are only four partitions. Partitions are our unit of parallelism. Partitions are our unit of scale, which is why figuring out your partitioning strategy up front is a good thing to do. Because if you start off with one partition, you can't go anywhere. If you start off with like a million partitions, that's probably a bad idea also. So there's various rules of thumb out there, which are a good idea to follow. Like give it, I don't know, I'm picking numbers here. There are better ones out there. I'll post on the Slack channel afterwards. Give it 16 partitions to start off with, and then you've got room to grow. You can still consume it with a single instance of, instance of the application if you want to. So the consumer API, a little bit more complicated because we can actually handle scaling within it. We call it from our client applications. It reads messages from topics. It can scan back and forth in the log. Messages don't get deleted when we read them. It's horizontally scalable. We can just add in additional instances of an application to form a consumer group. And again, client languages available for numerous different languages, client libraries available for numerous different languages, and the REST proxy also. We also need to think about where this data is going to live. We talked conceptually about a log, and this like very abstract idea of like an immutable app end only commit log. But this log itself needs to live somewhere, and where it lives is on a broker. So Kafka Brokers, the actual JVM process that you install and that you run, and actually does this stuff that your clients are going to connect to. And it's a distributed system. I've not really mentioned that up until this point, but that commit log that we talked about is actually a distributed commit log, an app end only immutable commit log that's distributed across multiple brokers. So like a distributed system, you'll usually have three or more instances of a broker so that the data gets spread across them. Each of our partitions gets allocated across the available brokers, and each partition has what's called a leader partition. But in kind of standard distributed systems way, we also have followers, which are replicas of the primary, of the leader. So now, in the case of, let's say, partition three, partition three has got its leader on broker three, by coincidence, that's not kind of um, um, always, always the way. So partition three lives on broker three. We also have follower partitions on broker two and broker one. If we lose broker three, okay, in our nice little fire then, then broker two, well, in this case, will take over the responsibility for the leader partition for that uh, partition. So a distributed system, you'll have three or probably many more brokers to hold that data and to serve that data to the client applications. So this is kind of good. We've got a distributed system. It gives us the concept of an immutable app end only commit log. We send our events to it. We can consume our events from it. But in a way, we're only just getting started because what I've laid out here is the foundations and the very, very strong and solid foundations with some fantastic guarantees over how it, how it does things, but the foundations for working with events. But when it comes to building applications with events, it's kind of tedious if we have to reinvent everything else all the time. And this is where the, the ecosystem bits of Kafka comes in, because the producer and the consumer APIs and the brokers, they're just like the starting blocks. What we've actually got within Apache Kafka is a lot more. So let's take a look through that. The reasons why Kafka does a lot more than just what I've shown you so far is that when you come to actually use it, you realize that there are common patterns and common requirements around what people build. And one example would be when people start building streaming pipelines, when they say, I've got data that's sat in one place and I want to stream it and go and put it somewhere else. I've got data that's sat in a transactional system. I want to offload it to an analytical platform like S3. Well, because the data is not deleted when I push it to S3 because it's stored in a topic, I also want to take that same data and push it to HDFS. That's kind of useful. We've got systems coming into Kafka, systems going out of Kafka. We could say, actually, I want to build a new application. 
and it's going to be a microservice and it's going to use Kafka as its broker. And this application needs to be driven by events from an existing application. And existing applications, a lot of the time, have got a database sat underneath them. And what we can actually do is, without needing to modify that existing application, because it's a closed box third party or it's a legacy system in-house that we don't touch, we can actually hook into the database, which that system, that application is writing and what it's changes to, capture the events out of the database into a Kafka topic and drive a new application from it. And in both of these examples, whether it's applications or pipelines, we're integrating different systems. We're saying stream data in from a database and push it to S3. Stream data and capture events from this database so we can drive an application from it. And so we start thinking, well, that's interesting. How am I going to get that data from the database into Kafka? How am I going to push that data from Kafka to S3 and to HDFS? Well, I saw this talk at Gotopia once, and there's this chap, and he was talking about the producer API and the consumer API. So I guess I'm going to write a Java program, and I'm going to pull the database and use the producer API to write some records to a Kafka topic. And then I'm going to have to take a program, maybe I'll write in Python, and I'll connect, I'll use the consumer API to connect to this topic, and I'll push the data to HDFS. And then we'll use something else and push it to S3. And well, actually, we've got lots of integrations that we're doing here. Maybe we could write ourselves a framework. Maybe. Like we could actually do something like we're going to sit down and go into a dark room for like six months and build this thing. And it can like pull data in from all these places and push data to these places. And we can make it configuration based and we can make it pluggable and we can handle schemas and we can handle restarts and scalability. It should be a load of fun. But the problem is that as Admiral Ackbar will tell us, it's a trap. Because in writing that framework, you're not actually doing anything different from what every other business is doing. Everyone's streaming data from, Kaf from a database into Kafka. Everyone needs to take data from Kafka and push it to S3 or Elasticsearch or Snowflake or any number of other places. Everyone writing frameworks would be kind of wasting their time and reinventing the wheel because it exists already. So Apache Kafka includes the Kafka Connect API, which lets you stream data in from systems upstream into Kafka, push data from Kafka topics downstream to any number of other places. So we can actually do this integration, whether it's like end-to-end -end pipelines or streaming data in from sources to drive our applications using Kafka Connect. It's configuration-based. You set up um, a bit of JSON to describe what you want to do. It's pluggable. So you say, I want to use this connector for this technology. I want to serialize my data in this way. It's also a distributed system. So it's fault tolerant, it's scalable, it manages schemas. It does all of this stuff for you. So as much fun as writing frameworks is, unfortunately, Kafka's stolen your thunder on this one. So instead, you get to go and write applications that actually deliver business value. You get all of the different connectors and so on from Confluent Hub. You type in the technology that you're interested in, and off you go. Now, let's take another step back for a moment and think about this data that we're actually talking about integrating. We've said we're going to get data in from a database. and We're going to push data down to S3. But I also said, well, let's model these events as like just this humble little square or rectangle on the screen and say it's just like a key value. And we've got another key value and we're appending these keys and values to the log. But actually, what is it? It's kind of like fairly abstract saying that's a key and a value. And if we're thinking, well, this thing sounds useful, let's go and build something in it. We need to think about like, well, okay, well, tell us a bit more. What actually is inside that box? Now, hopefully, what's not inside the box is this but unfortunately, sometimes it is. But Kafka itself doesn't care what's inside that box. It just says, if you want to, give me a key, and then give me a value, and it's just bytes. So as developers, as data engineers, we need to decide how am I gonna serialize that data to give Kafka the bytes that it needs. And hopefully we don't choose this option, which if we eyeball that set of data, I guess it's tab separated, maybe. It looks like there's some address fields in there, maybe a date, maybe a latitude and longitude on it, who knows? So what Kafka enables you to do, like we saw earlier, is build loosely coupled systems. Something, an event happens, produces data into a topic. Another application or numerous applications can use that data and consume that data from the topic. Nice and loosely coupled, this is brilliant. But then if we don't think about how we're serializing our data and specifically how we're managing our schemas, we start to build those couplings back together in terms of humans having to speak to each other or email or slack each other and say, that data you've written onto a topic here, like what on earth is that supposed to be saying? And what are the different fields? And like, did you just delete a field from that schema and like without telling us? And what's the default? And is this like a big int or is it a date? And like all of those common things around schemas. 
So there are good ways and there are bad ways to serialize your data. Because if you want to build systems which are resilient and don't like break every time you blink or think of coughing, which you certainly shouldn't do in a pandemic, then you want to be thinking about your schemas because schemas act as the contract, they act as the API between your services, whether you're building pipelines or applications. So if you use Avro or Protoboff or JSON schema, you actually have a schema which we store and persist and then consumers can use that schema. If you use JSON, you're kind of like, well, it looks like there's a schema, but it's not actually explicit and declared. And if you use CSV, then like, oh, come and see me later. I'll talk to you about that. So if we use Avro, Protoboff, JSON schema, the Confluence schema registry, it's community licensed, it will actually store the schema for you. It will enforce schema compatibility guarantees on the producer. So once the producer has said, here is the schema, they can't subsequently say like, oh, and just write these messages to the topic as well, even though they don't match. It won't let you do that for good reasons. Because the consumer, when they come to read that data, they'll go to the schema registry, they'll fetch the schema, they'll be able to deserialize that data. And those compatibility guarantees mean that a consumer will be able to read that data. And it will know what the fields are within that data. It will know the data types and the field names. So it's a very, very good idea to do. The other piece of the puzzle in terms of like the ecosystem and the common things that people build with event-driven platforms is what they're actually doing within these consumers. So we've got data going in, data coming out. And if we think about the kind of things that you do with data, it often boils down into a few repeating patterns. And there's other stuff as well, there's plenty of other things. But some of these common patterns include driving alerts based on events or wanting to take data and aggregate it up and do something with that aggregate, whether to look at kind of like uh, particular trends and drive an alert from that, or simply to like take an aggregate and report on that, or use it to drive a dashboard out to your user, or to take data and push it somewhere else for further analytics. And as part of this, it's basically like describing stream processing. Take some data, join it, aggregate it, enrich it, do these kind of things with it. And so over time, as our events are occurring, we have this stream coming in and we want to process it. We want to do some fairly standard patterns to it. So I'd say maybe we've got widgets, information at our widgets and widgets have got different colors. They've got yellow widgets and red widgets. We'd like to create a new stream as the source data comes in based on that source events as they're arriving, only about red widgets. So various data coming in, we want to filter that data as it arrives and write it out to a new topic because that new topic is going to be used to drive an alerting system which integrates with Kafka because most things integrate with Kafka nowadays. And we can do that using the Kafka Streams API. So Kafka Streams is again part of Apache Kafka. It's a Java library. And so instead of doing your stream processing like on a, out on a separate technology and a separate infrastructure and a separate team somewhere else, you can actually do your stream processing within your Java applications. You can say, I'm going to do my filtering, my aggregations, my enrichment, my uh, transformations within my Java application itself. My data comes in, I filter it. And so this is an abstraction on top of the producer and consumer APIs. Yes, you could do like stream processing yourself and use producer and consumer APIs, but it's an awful lot simpler if you use the library that's provided, which is Kafka Streams. So instead of writing consuming, uh, consumer API applications, we write streams applications. Now, not everyone writes stream processing application, or writes uh, Java, sorry, but they still want to do stream processing. So in this case, they can use KSQL DB. KSQL DB, again, is community licensed. And here we use SQL to describe our stream processing transformations. We can say, take this stream of data, select from this stream where it matches this predicate. And like in the database world, you say, create table as select. In the streaming world, you say, create stream as select. And because the data in the source is unbounded, it's continuous, it never stops, so does that select statement because there's no end to it. It's not like selecting against relational data where there's like a lump of data and when you've selected from it, it might take an age if you've not indexed it, but you can select from that relational data and then it returns eventually. In a streaming world, you can select from that inbound stream, but that stream is unbounded, so our select query runs continually, so that continual output from that select it's written out to your target stream, which is a Kafka topic. So if we think about the kind of things that we want to do with that data, we can write alerts against it. We can say, I would like to take this stream of inbound data and apply a predicate to it. 
I would like to take this inbound data and aggregate it or aggregate it and apply a predicate. Or I'd like to take this data and I'd like to use Kafka Connect to actually route it down to a target system. So I believe I have five minutes left. I'll show you a very brief demo um, and then I'll share a couple of resources to finish off with. Um, we'll do questions on Slack because I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll run out of time, but I do want to show you the demo because it's useful to get an idea of the kind of things you want to do. The demo itself is on GitHub. So again, I'll post this on Slack afterwards, so demo scene, and the whole script itself is also there. So you can just say Docker Compose up, and it brings up the whole stack, and you can actually go and try it out for yourself. So what we've got here is a Kafka topic that's been populated with a uh, producer somewhere else which is over here. And on this topic, we've got information about stock trades. So we're connecting to the broker, we're saying, show me the data from this particular topic. And it says like, it's buys and the sells and there's different symbols and kind of like fairly standard set of data. And I want to show you a couple of things that we can do in terms of this stream processing. So here we're using key SQL DB. Um, and we're going to say, I'd like to declare an object, a stream on top of that topic that you showed me. And because we're using Avro, we don't actually have to type in the schema. I can say describe uh, trades, and it says here is your particular stream that you've created, and there's the schema. Because we're using the schema registry and Avro, I can say, well, we've got a schema, so I can then project the fields from it. And I can say select just a few of the fields, so let's select the side and the quantity from trades, where the symbol is this, and it says like, okay, every message which now arrives, I'm gonna apply that predicate to it, and I'm just gonna echo out to the screen those two fields that you've asked for. And using KSQL DB, we can build an aggregate view of that data, and actually kind of like a materialized view, in effect. It's actually building this stateful aggregation internally. KSQL DB, like Kafka Streams, is a distributed system, so you scale it out for performance and for resilience. And we're going to create an object, in this case a table, which is going to hold the state, like how many trades have there been, what's the total value, and so on, every 15 minutes, just for this particular stock symbol. And it creates that table. And we can say select star from that table. And it says, okay, there is the contents of the table. And you can see it's got a window start and end, which will show as an epoch. Um, so these are the aggregate values as new um, values arrive on that source topic, it's updating that aggregate. And under the covers, if I say show tables, it says we've got a table called, uh, sorry, Kafka topic called the name of the table, and we can actually consume from that. So at this point now, we've populated a new Kafka topic with the state of this aggregate. So we can take that aggregate and drive an application from it, we can also hook it up to an external data target. That's what we're going to do here. I'm going to show you Kafka Connect. This is obviously a super quick demo of some of the pieces, but I want to just give you a flavor of the kind of thing that you can do. So we've got an inbound stream of data. We've said, let's create an aggregate that's being refreshed and maintained in real time. I'm going to push this, in this case, down to a database, so down to Postgres using Kafka Connect. And now if I head over to Postgres, um, first off, I'm just going to do a, a, a select from that stream. So this is from that stream that we created. So this is the source data as it arrives. So that's at the top of the screen there. And at the bottom of the screen, I'm going to go into Postgres. And I'm going to say select from this table that we're populating. So at the top of the screen is the data as it arrives. And it's actually flowing by there like loads and loads of stuff at the beginning, because that's reading all of the data from the topic at the beginning. Whereas now it's saying we've just caught up and now we're just showing you any new rows that arrive. So if you look at the data, so 1045 is the window most recently, so 1045 in the UK right now, 71 buys, 67 sells. If I rerun that query, let's move that up so you can see the column headings. Uh, so you're looking at this bit here, this, the buy and the sell, 61 and, sorry, 71 and 67. Now 82 and 73. If I run it again, 83. So as new messages arrive on our source topic, KSQL DB um, updates the aggregates, and in this case, we're pushing that aggregate down to a target. But we can also query that aggregate directly from KSQL DB. So you can do some very, very cool things, but unfortunately, I'm pretty much out of time. So I'll share a couple of resources, and then any other questions, and if you want more links that show this kind of stuff in detail, um, hit me up on Slack, and I can share as much as you would like to see. So quick recap, a super, super quick recap. Events are all around us. They model the real world. 
We store them as key values in an immutable, app-end-only distributed commit log. We have the log at the heart of things. We have produced from consumer APIs. We have Kafka Connect providing the integration API, and we have Kafka Streams giving us the uh, stream processing capabilities. And this gives us Apache Kafka. Around Apache Kafka, we have things like Confluent Platform, which include KSQL DB and Schema Registry to build out a more complete ecosystem for being able to build applications and pipelines. Go and learn more from these, these uh, books that you can download for free from our website. Um, go and try out Confluent Cloud. Um, there's various discount codes and, or um, money off codes that you can use there. And finally, if you want to learn more and actually try this stuff out, developer.confluent.io is where you can go for that.